Hello, this is your host Sopman Bhartia and today we have with us Marshall Lilworth, the founder and CEO of Canonical, the parent company of Ubuntu operating system. We are here at the OpenStack Summit Sydney and during this conference, OpenStack Foundation announced that they will be focusing on collaboration and open. Uh, if you know OpenStack, they have been evolving because new use cases are coming up. So they are changing and adopting as the market is changing and the market is embracing uh, OpenStack. So Mark, since uh, Canonical is a stakeholder of OpenStack, how do you see this evolution of OpenStack? Well, I think OpenStack is maturing and that gets reflected in the questions that the foundation is starting to ask in terms of um, their mission and focus. Uh, there have been some very good shifts over the last year. I think the, the, the most important thing is that people are now comfortable with the idea that OpenStack should be focused on infrastructure as a service. The foundation is also interested in other you know, infrastructure questions, but I see a lot less confusion now about what OpenStack is really good for. The emergence of other communities, like the Kubernetes community, make it pretty clear that OpenStack is the place to talk about virtualized infrastructure on demand and self-service infrastructure, and other com communities are going to be the place where you go and talk about container orchestration operations or edge cloud or, or IoT. I recall a few years ago you said that the OpenStack community should stop uh, BS as a service and should focus on the core features of OpenStack, which is compute, networking, and storage. So, do you think that they listen to you, or you kind of, you know, you had an idea that this is the right way for the OpenStack community to evolve? Oh, I, I don't know that I can answer that question. Who, who knows what the answer to that question is? But, but I, I think at the end of the day, people are now um, focused on the right things. OpenStack needs to work. It needs to work reliably, it needs to work at scale, and it needs to essentially provide that VM infrastructure as a service capability. And um, you know that's what we've always said, that's what we've always focused on. There was a ton of other stuff going on in the OpenStack, sort of under the OpenStack umbrella, that I don't think made much sense, and that's now mostly gone. So what remains is useful and focused, and uh, I think grow increasingly mature. Um, so very exciting stuff that's going on, cells and the ability to really scale OpenStack I think is very exciting. Um, uh, on, the, on, the opposite air, uh, on the opposite extreme, like this conversation around edge computing I think is very exciting, sort of as a, a, a step between the, the centralized clouds and the IoT, the single node devices that are out there. Um, and then, you know, continued maturity around the operations regime of OpenStack itself. Um, uh, the upgrade processes and so on. I think that's all good and important work. When you look at the cloud today, uh, there are so many different components. There, OpenStack is there, uh, and then you have Kubernetes is being used. There, Shep is, a lot of different things are being used, and, and all these projects are being maintained by totally different foundations or totally different communities. But you need all of that together to build your cloud. So do you, what kind of challenges there, you know, or do you think there is some problem that, you know, these are maintained by different communities, but they have to work together? It's normal from my perspective for there to be different communities that have different missions and different focuses. You know, look at the diversity of open source today, right? From um, CAD CAM engineering all the way through to, um, you know, giant cloud infrastructures all the way out to Raspberry Pis um, doing interesting things, right? Um, diversity and having different leadership and different communities, that isn't a bad thing, that's a good thing, right? It, 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 it enables us to track the right kind of talent to the right kind of community collaboration framework for the right kind of problem, right? So, to me, it's not it's not a problem that Kubernetes exists in a completely different community to, to OpenStack. I mean, that's normal. We've had the Linux Foundation for a long time. We've had the Apache Software Foundation for a long time. I think you have to be good at working across communities and you have to be good at integrating stuff from different communities. And, yeah. and, and none, of, none of that really is a reason to, 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 to change things. I, I totally agree, but what are the chances that you know, the agenda or the goal of these communities, these foundations may be different from you know, uh, 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 a different foundation? So uh, doesn't it create a like, problem or challenges for you know, a vendor like Canonical to kind of like, put everything together? 
Oh, it's normal for us to, to essentially integrate things from different communities, right? I mean, we've been doing that forever. Linux distributions have been doing that for, forever. It's normal for us, for example, to work with Hadoop on bare metal and Kubernetes on bare metal and on OpenStack and on a public cloud. Uh, we work on, with Linux on different devices. N none, of this, none of this is a problem. Um, look, it's clear that the foundation wants to explore a, you know, a broader cross-section of infrastructure, and I think that's fine. My interest is in OpenStack as a you know, self-service, virtual machines, virtual networks, virtual disks, on-demand capability for enterprises and telcos. And I think it's great for that. In fact, it's increasingly mature and it's increasingly um, operable for, for those purposes. Um, I think it's up to the foundation to explore other you know, areas of infrastructure and if they find stuff that's, that, that they can effectively provide a government, governance home from, then that's great. But it isn't something that I have a particular opinion about or, or, or a need for. Right? IoT is becoming a very interesting use case and Canonical has its own stake in IoT space. You, know, you have Ubuntu Core, Snap there. Um, uh, when you look at you know OpenStack, you know and IoT spec, what are the new market kind of emerging in the same context? Can you talk about that a bit? Look, the thing that I'm really excited about is is technologists and entrepreneurs doing really interesting things. Um, in the cloud, we see a lot of that. We see new businesses getting created around you know um, uh, digital transformation or mobile or, or even the web still, right? What's interesting about IoT at the other end of the spectrum is that it's um, always grounded in sort of real things. You know, in the cloud, it's kind of abstract. People who are competing in the cloud, they're kind of competing for the whole global market of an idea. Whereas in the physical world, you can't do that. In the physical world, there are lots of reasons why you could win the Australian market but not the Japanese market, right? And so what I love about IoT is that it's, it's technologists, right, software engineers and, and, and industrial engineers, um, and entrepreneurs, people with like business ideas, but um, uh, they're doing sort of highly fragmented, highly specialized, super interesting, real things. So that's why I love IoT at the moment. I think it's very vibrant. You meet a lot of really interesting people. I think there will be a lot of people who become millionaires, right, rather than a few people who become billionaires. And I think that's cool, right? Almost anybody who looks around them can spot an opportunity for IoT. And if they know how to take a Raspberry Pi and Ubuntu and some software and make magic happen, then they can do very well for themselves, right? And so I, I love that. I think that, that that makes for a very exciting environment. Can you talk about some, some use cases in, in, in context of Ubuntu and Canonical in the IoT space that you've seen any deployments? Um, so we're doing a bunch of different things in IoT. First, we, 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 we're enabling Ubuntu on a very wide range of hardware, um, from Samsung Arctic through the Intel um, IoT modules, um, uh, you know, millions of different kinds of CPU effectively. By putting Ubuntu on them, we enable people to put and uh, you know to separate the application development process from the hardware selection process. Right? They can develop their apps on Ubuntu, and then they can choose late which which piece of hardware they want. That's the first thing that we're doing. The second thing that we're doing is a lot of work around um, the production environment. Um, the production environment for IoT is very challenging. You have millions of devices, they're very widely spread, they're physical devices, which means that if something breaks, you have to physically go there to fix it, right? They're not virtual devices. And so um, we have to put a lot of thinking into how we make it so that you can deliver new software to those devices every day and take very little risk in, of breaking it effectively in doing that. So that's what we're doing with Snaps. They're a very um, efficient way to put software on a device very reliably and then update that software every day with very low risk effectively. If that software doesn't work, you can go back to the previous version of the software. So it's not so much that we're going to be experts in cameras or in railways or in sound equipment or in drones or in robots or in cars. What we are experts in is effectively what it feels like to operate millions of those things all around the world very cheaply um, changing the software on them for security reasons or for business reasons every single day. We have been hearing a lot about machine learning these days and 
uh, from from canonical perspective especially in the iot space a cloud machine learning is going to play a very big role you know not just to offer you know additional services to customers but also to make the stack itself smarter to help with logging monitoring and all those things uh, so, so can you can you tell us you know from your perspective how mature is machine learning in this space and uh, what role do you think it's going to play I think machine learning is a new class of software you know over, over the years we've, we've we've seen new programming languages emerge that have consequences right they enable different kinds of software to get built right uh, in a sense a, 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 a deep learning model right is kind of like a piece of software that software gets written in a different way. It gets written through essentially studying data and, 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 and analyzing data and distilling all of that data down into a, a, a neural model or, or, or a, 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 um, an inferencing engine. But you can just think of that as like a piece of software, right? It's an exciting new class of software, but it's really just software. Um, what we see emerging as the pattern is that you know, data moves to the cloud, that data is analyzed in the cloud, the machine learning happens in the cloud. But what's really exciting is when the, the results of that machine learning come out to the edge, to your, to your devices, and then you get an experience at the edge that's sort of unlike any other software experience people have had before. Whether that is you know, natural language processing on your camera or uh, image recognition on, on, uh, um, uh, on your front door, who knows, right? There's, there's, there's a huge amount of diversity and, and entrepreneurial energy in what you might do with AI. But the way I think about it, it's just another class of software, effectively, a, a, a new kind of software. But, but what's your expectation? How do you think uh, machine learning is going to change the world around us? Um, well, my expectation is that more and more of the software that we use every day will have some machine learning or machine intelligence element to it. Sometimes that will be, you know, the software that you've downloaded has inferencing engines built into it, and sometimes it will be um, that the software that you're using is part of some sort of training mechanism to to um, to, to drive behaviors elsewhere. Um, uh, I, I don't know what to say. You know what I mean? Like Ubuntu is an is, a, is an umbrella that wraps its arms around lots of kinds of software. Machine learning and deep learning and, and the AI, those are just essentially a new class of software. Yeah. Let's, let's change the topic quickly and just talk about what are the things that excite you more these days? You started Ubuntu way back in 2004 and it's like, you know, 2017, 18 now. So, so let's talk about that, you know, market who keeps coming up with new ideas and gets excited about new sure. things. Well, I take, I take pleasure from fairly simple things in life, right? I, I like gardening and I'm very lucky I am building a botanical garden that I hope will be around for you know, much longer than I am. Uh, and uh, um, you know, I, I really enjoy the fact that free software is now at the center of so many interesting things, right? I don't find enterprise boring at all. I find it very, very exciting, right? We're taking very complex things and making them better, making them more efficient. Um, uh, it's exciting to me that the ideas behind Ubuntu uh, are moving so to the center of machine learning, AI, telco operations, cloud operations, and IoT, right? So um, it's not like I get to the end of the day and I'm really relieved, you know, to be done with the day. I love what I do every day and I love the people that I work with. Um, and uh, my, my, my other pursuits and hobbies and interests are fairly simple. <laughs> so where are you building this botanical garden? Oh, at home. So I live on a farm and it's, it's, it's doing less and less farming and more and more gardening. Yeah. This question is very close to my heart because when I started my own journalism journey, uh, and it was my first job was in the open source and Linux magazine. Uh, one of the challenge back in those days, which was like 2005, was that uh, we had to write stories that used to educate people about the benefits of open source, that why they should use open source or contribute to it. Nowadays, almost everybody is using it. Uh, but the new set of challenges that kind of emerged is that people don't understand how open source works, how its development water works, how the, how the community works, how you should be uh, kind of contributing back so that the product that you rely on are sustainable. So, so do you also see the same challenges uh, as the adoption of open source kind of, you know, there's an explosion kind of going on with adoption? 
Oh, I can I can relate to what you say. You know, we're, we are in 2017, and it's frustrating when you when you run into a person inside a large organization and they don't understand, you know, what the what both the rights and the obligations are associated with free software. But I don't worry about it. At the end of the day, um, there are enough people who understand open source to kind of keep it moving in the right direction. I wouldn't worry too much about the loose ends at the edges. You know, the general direction as you say, is that more and more institutions are open first. Uh, think about AI, you know, this is possibly the most exciting new field of research for the very large technology companies. And they are all trying to push as much of what they know into open source as fast as possible. So instead of holding on to things, they're actually pushing it out into the open uh, arena. Now, is it perfect every time? No, but I don't think that matters. The arc of history here is absolutely in the right direction and you and lots of other people worked to essentially steer things in that direction. So uh, no, I, feel, I feel pretty good about uh, the, the, the um, long-term prospects for open source and free software. Now let's talk about Ubuntu, a product that kind of disrupted the Linux desktop space. Ubuntu 18.4 is going to be released, which is going to be uh, the first LTS after a very long time uh, that will come with GNOME as the default desktop environment and shell. Uh, personally, I think it's a good thing for the desktop community because uh, Canonical can now focus on the pure Ubuntu experience, the base, and the uh, GNOME community can you know build on, you know, they have a wide community on all the things that, you know, uh, the community needs. So I think it's the best of the both world. But from your perspective, what do you think about this transition, this change? Um, I'm very grateful to the GNOME community for the work that they've done to build, uh, you know, GNOME Shell and so on. And, and I'm impressed with how the Ubuntu community have engaged and the GNOME community have engaged. I think that uh, uh, the 1804 desktop, GNOME desktop, is going to be clean and reliable. Um, you know, there continue to be a bunch of different desktop environments. The KDE guys are doing great work. Um, Mate or Mate has emerged as a great desktop. Um, I am going to be using the GNOME desktop, but I see a ton of other people in the office using all of the other ones. So I think that's, that's good too. Um, I miss the work around Unity. I really enjoyed thinking about how different kinds of personal computing could come together and converge. For me personally, that was a very ambitious, forward-looking project, and I'm sorry that we weren't able to see it through. I'm glad that there are some community uh, and some folks at Canonical who will essentially maintain Unity, um, uh, uh, and so you know, for, for folks who like that experience, I think that's great. But at the end of the day, my personal focus now is the the enterprise and the automated data center side of things, and the and the edge, the IoT and micro cloud kind of environments and so for me that's a full day and uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, you know reminiscing about uh, projects that, that I was unable to pull off. Canonical has been a true disruptor in this space uh, if you look at Upstart uh, or uh, Mirror even if these you know projects did not succeed and did not become the default in the Linux world they disrupted the whole community they disrupted the market and uh, that's why we have you know system D today or uh, VLAN community woke up and you know started working on it so finally we may have you know a modern display uh, server for Linux then you also started the phone project uh, even if the project did not succeed it gave the community a vision that you know they can have uh, the fully open source phone into their pocket and now Purism project is there and a lot of work is going on around that so you have kind of uh, showed people that you know there is a possibility they can do it so, first of all, thanks for doing that. I appreciate you saying so. It's always more satisfying to win, though, right? Yeah, that's true, but you have won a lot of big battles, so it's really impressive. Sure, I've had my fair share. No, the, the, the question that I want to ask before we wrap up this interview is that there have been a lot of stories about Canonical going public, that Canonical is going to announce an IPO. Uh, so, what exactly is going on? What is your long-term strategy with Canonical? Can you talk a bit about that? Look, if you look at our trajectory, um, more and more companies are signing up with Canonical for a portion of their enterprise infrastructure. They have a relationship with VMware, they have a relationship with Microsoft, they have a relationship with Red Hat, but increasingly they want a relationship with Canonical as well. So I'm pretty confident that over the next 10 years, every major business in the world is going to have some portion of its infrastructure 
both cloud infrastructure or data center infrastructure and IoT edge infrastructure is going to be on Ubuntu and supported by Canonical. So I think that gives us uh, great growth prospects and it, it puts us in a position of responsibility in terms of you know, 21st century businesses. So I'm quite comfortable that we can hold our own on the back of that as a, as a public company. We talked internally with the team, you know, we have different options and there was enough desire amongst the leadership team for us to go down the course of being a public company that we've made that commitment. That's the path that we want to be on. Um, uh, we made some tough choices in April to put that in, you know, to, to put ourselves on that course. It meant that we had to stop doing some things that, that we enjoyed doing. Um, we've had, you know, a good start to that journey. The last six months have been good for the company. We've um, delivered for a lot of customers. It's a bit easier now because we're a bit more focused on, on, on things that customers are, are talking to us about. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm pretty proud of what the team has done in those six months. Um, over the course of the next year, we'll take the next step uh, and then, you know, the, the, the timeline will, will, uh, will unfold as it should. <laughs> there is always a last question. Now you're back to being the CEO of the company, so has your role changed within the company? Uh, how is it different than what you were doing earlier? I do have a different job now. Uh, I do have a different set of responsibilities. Um, I'm, I'm very grateful to Jane who carried those responsibilities while I shifted to focus um, on the product story. Um, the, the team has really grown up. Um, I wouldn't say we've gotten old, but we've certainly grown up. And so, you know, I'm in the fortunate position that there are good leads for a bunch of the different things commercially and technically that need to happen at Canonical. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm enjoying, uh, I'm enjoying the new sort of responsibilities. I think we covered a lot of topic. Anything else you would like to talk about? No, that's a good set. It's nice to see you. It's good that the sun has come out in Sydney. Oh, yeah, it's been raining like crazy, and it's nice to see you too. Mark, thank you so much for talking to us today. I really appreciate it. And we'll look forward to the next version of Ubuntu and all the big things that Canonical is planning. Thank you so much. And back to our audience, thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we publish interviews and shows on a regular basis. We are also creating a podcast on SoundCloud. Last but not the least, do follow us on Twitter. You can find links to all these pages on tfir.io slash tv. This is Swapil Bhartia. See you next time. Bye for now.